What would it be like if people began to speak in tongues in, a, in an evangelical church like ours? What if, you know, the Spirit of God came and just like, um, just like uh, the day of Pentecost and Acts chapter 2, everyone began to speak in tongues? What would you do? <laughs> what if you're the only person in this room that didn't speak in tongues? What would you do? Start to ask the Lord why. <laughs> <laughs> ask the Lord why. <laughs> yeah, what, what if, yeah. <laughs> you go somewhere else. I ask that question because it's important for us to understand not everything that happens to other Christians happens to us. Right? And if you were there on the day of Pentecost, and the topic for today is not about Pentecost, but um, this is very important. If you were there on the day of Pentecost and you were the one who was looking at the disciples and hearing them speak in tongues, and you're wondering if these guys are drunk at before 9 o'clock in the morning, and and you're hearing someone speak in your language, what would you do? What would you say? Right? Yeah. What if we see Herschel just rolling on the floor today and speaking in tongues? Frank knows what shop means. But when, when, when you hear Frank say, ay, 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 that means he's shot. <laughs> so, moving on. Moving on. Today is the Feast of Transfiguration. And if you had received the GCI Weekly Update, um, Joseph Tkach mentioned or talked about the um, experience on the Mountain of Transfiguration. Now, we don't know which mountain it is in Israel. Uh, some say it's Mount Hermon, which is uh, about 2,000 feet less than the height of Mount Charleston. Some say it's Mount Tabor, which is half the height or the elevation of Lone Mountain. Do you know where Lone Mountain is? You guys should know, right? It's from Las Vegas. It's on the western side. Uh, you know where Lone Mountain Street is? Yeah, go straight west on Lone Mountain, you'll hit Lone Mountain. It's 3,000 plus feet. Mount Tabor is only half that elevation. Now, we have Jesus inviting Peter, John, and James with him. And, and that's in Luke chapter 9, verse 28. Now, actually, you can look at all the Gospels and it's mentioned there. Um, the three... Uh, synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all tell the story about the, um, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. John mentions it, but doesn't tell the exact story. Peter, in his second letter, mentions that he was there. So about eight days after Jesus said this, what did Jesus say? If you look in the previous uh, verses, he said that... Um, Time will come, you will see the Son of Man in all His glory. And eight days after that, Jesus said this. After Jesus said this, He took Peter, John, and James with Him and went up onto a mountain to pray. We don't know what that mountain is and how high it is. As He was praying, the appearance of His face changed and His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Ever seen a flash of lightning? It's about as bright as that. Now, in I think it's Matthew or Mark, his explanation was his clothes were as white as anyone could ever bleach them. Have you ever used bleach? Well, if you used industrial bleach, it would be really pretty white, right? Now, he's, this guy says it's it's as bright as a flash of lightning. I think this is far brighter than any bleach can do. <coughs> Verse 32 men. Moses, who represents the law, and Elijah, who represents the prophets. So, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, when they say the law and the prophets, what do they mean? 
When you eat, when you see the words the law and the prophets, what do they mean? Huh? No. The law and the prophets refer to the entire Old Testament. Now, the entire Old Testament is not just the law and the prophets. It's the law and the prophets and the writings. The writings include the history of Israel, like 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, um, Ezra, Nehemiah. These are all part of the writings. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Those, those are huge parts of the writings. Now, the prophets, that includes, you know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and even the minor prophets. And the law, that includes the five books of Moses, which is Genesis, um, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, the law, and the prophets, but also the writings. So when you hear the word, the, the phrase, the law and the prophets, it's referring to the entire Old Testament. So Moses and Elijah actually represented the entire Old Testament and also represented the entire Old Covenant. They were under the Old Covenant. So was John the Baptist, who was the second Elijah. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor. And the New Testament talks about the Old Covenant being glorious. But not as glorious as Jesus. And they were talking with Jesus. Verse 31, they spoke about his departure. Departure from what? Huh? Departure from this world. Which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So they were on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus had his mind set for Jerusalem. And in, on their journey, he takes James and John and Peter with him up a mountain to experience this, to see his glory. Verse 32, Peter and his companions were, what? Very sleepy. Do you know another story in the scriptures where Peter, James, and John were very sleepy? Where was that? At seven, yeah, at the garden. It seems to me that these three guys Whenever they're with Jesus and Jesus decides to pray, they're very sleepy. <laughs> now, if you like your pillow when you're praying, you know, you're in good company. <laughs> Peter, James, and John. Always very sleepy. Don't know why. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. The two men. Who were the two men? Moses. And Elijah. Verse 33. As the men were leading Jesus, who were these men? Moses and Elijah. As Moses and Elijah were leaving Jesus, departing from him, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters. Now, if you're looking for a shelter, this is a good place, right? It says, Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now you read in the parenthesis, Peter did not know what he was saying. Now how many of us have put our foot in our mouth? That was Peter. Peter was very, uh, how do you say that, impetuous? Um, yeah, he, he, he speaks before he thinks. Right, he puts his foot in his mouth all the time. Well, here he was. Master, let's put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Of course, he didn't know what he was saying. Now, if you go to all three um, accounts in the Gospels, all of them say this. Peter didn't know what he was saying. Uh, it's funny because they expected the entire world to read the Gospels, or at least the entire church. And they were open enough to say, you know what, this guy Peter, the future Pope, he didn't know what he was talking about. So, was Peter the Pope? 
No, probably not. He was not infallible when he spoke these words. Verse 34, while, while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them. See the cloud over there? The fog. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. So, did they enter the cloud or the cloud came and covered them? The cloud came and covered them. But as they were into the cloud, they became very afraid. Now, what time of the year was this? Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, so this must have been before Passover. Were there was there a fog? And was there fog during this time? This was probably during springtime. Now you don't expect fog. Except if you, if you live in San Francisco. Like I used to live in San Francisco. I wanted to see the Gold, Golden Gate all the time. But if you go to the Golden Gate Bridge, there's a place there where you can overlook the Golden Gate Bridge and the San Francisco Bay. It's beautiful if there's no fog. But most of the time, there's fog. So you don't know if you go up there, if you're going to see the Golden Gate Bridge or just the top or just the bottom. <clears throat> and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Now how many times have we heard this word or this voice in the scriptures? How many times have we seen this where the voice spoke out and said, This is my son whom I have chosen. Once was when? Huh? And his baptism, right. And this would be the Second time. So this is my son, whom I have chosen. But notice this. Listen to him. Now, let's backtrack a little bit. Peter, James, and John. What were they? What nationality? They were Jews, right? And what were their scriptures? The Old Testament, right. And to which religion did they belong? Judaism, right. So they listened to the Old Testament. They listened in the synagogue or they listened in the temple. They listened to the religious leaders. And the religious leaders looked to the Old Testament. They didn't have a new. They just looked to the Old. And they highlighted Moses, Abraham, Elijah, the heroes of the Old Testament, right? So if they had to listen to someone, they would listen to the religious leaders and the major characters in the Bible. Amen? Like we listen, if we're talking about the Constitution, we would listen to who? We'd be listening to the heroes of America, right? Who are they? Who, who framed the Constitution? Benjamin Franklin. Who else? Thomas Jefferson. Who else? I'm sorry? John Adams. I thought you said Jonathan Edwards. He wasn't alive back then. You would listen to those people, right? You go, you go to Washington, D.C., you'd see their figures. You would see their quotes. Right? You would read them in our history books, we study them, and we defend the Constitution. Amen? Their Constitution was the Old Testament. Our Constitution is the Constitution of the United States. So they would defend their Constitution. They would defend their law. They would defend their heroes. Right? They would go back to the writings. They would go back to the to the uh, the prophets. They would go back to Moses all the time. But here we see a voice. We hear a voice from the cloud saying, "This is my son, 
whom I have chosen. So who did God choose? What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. In Hebrew, Joshua. And he says, listen to who? He didn't say listen to Moses. He didn't say listen to Elijah. He didn't say listen to Abraham. He said listen to my son, Jesus. Verse 36. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. No one else with him. Let's have something, right? Is the one. Is the only one. Moses and Elijah. Nothing compared to Jesus. And that's why Peter or Paul says that even though the old covenant was glorious, nothing compares to the new covenant. It is more glorious. So if you want to go with more glorious rather than glorious, you go with who? Jesus. Jesus. More glorious. Not Moses. Jesus. And if you want more glorious, which covenant do you go with? The new covenant, right? The new covenant. So they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves. They didn't say anything to anyone. You know why? Because in another account, Jesus told them, don't tell this to anyone. Hush, keep quiet. Not until, he says, not until the crucifixion and the resurrection, which they didn't understand at the time. We're just like Peter and James and John. If we were up there on the mountain, these would be our emotional responses. Number one, it would be lethargy. We would be sleepy, just like them. Because what are we doing here again? How come Jesus always goes up to the mountain, takes us with him, and then he goes up and prays alone? What's up with this? Right? What's up with this? Why do we have to go up with the mountain and then we find him going up to a rock, kneeling down, probably praying by himself? Uh, sleeping. Second, we would also end up with confusion. Just like Peter. Christians as people, we find something's happening here. So what are we going to do? We need to do something. What are we going to do? Why is, why is Herschel on the floor rolling and speaking in tongues? We got to do something. Some, yeah, that's right. Something wrong with him. Why is Frank shouting and screaming saying, ay, ay, ay. You know, we got to do something. You know, why is... Who's here? The guy's not here. Let, 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 let's say Darren. Why is Darren weeping and crying and, and moaning? And, you know, we got to do something. It's confusing. The third emotional response would be fear. You know, when the cloud came, they were all afraid. Imagine, if the cloud of God came inside this room, what would you do? You would just fall down in fear. What is going on, right? What if you were there on Pentecost and this ball, this sound that sounds like Hurricane Katrina blows inside the room and, and then you see this ball of fire inside the room and then it bursts into flames and then it falls on Yvonne's head, Glenn's head, and Rose's head, and, and Beverly's head, and Jesse's head, and no. And then you see all these flames of fire all over everyone, and they're speaking in tongues. What would you do? Have a heart attack. Have a heart attack, correct. I'd probably be the first one to run out the door and say, Hey, what's going on? Got the right pull. Floor. Yeah, pull the fire alarm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trained to go grab that uh, fire extinguisher and go like this. Herschel! 
I'm here to help you. <laughs> Fear. And we'd be asking, what's going on? Now the whole world will say, what's going on in Las Vegas? <laughs> right? And GCI, people in Glendora will probably say, what's going on in Las Vegas? Let's send some people over there. <laughs> they need help. I would probably do the same thing if I were there, right? Wouldn't you? Yeah, if, if, if something happened in Glendora, like this, what would you do? We'd all run over there and say, what's going on here? Right? Same thing. It's, it's a totally natural response. And it's no one's fault. It's our natural response. And it's, you know, Jesus didn't say, you guys, you're sleeping again. Jesus didn't say, come on, Peter, you're so confused. Jesus didn't say, stop being afraid. Man up. <laughs> See, our tendencies is just like Peter. Peter would wanted to, because of his fear, his confusion, he wanted to Got to do something about this. Hey, this is a this is really a mountaintop experience. What are we going to do about this? Let's 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 put shelters. Let's preserve what happened here. Let's preserve the past. Isn't that what we always do? We want to preserve the past. It was all good, but the problem is that Jesus doesn't stop at the mountain top, right? Is Jesus still there on top of the Mount of Transfiguration? He's not there anymore. My friend always says, I have a friend in California, he always says, Look guys, Jesus is no longer at the top of the mountain. He went down to the valley. <laughs> and he keeps reminding us, Hey, stop looking at the past. Stop trying to preserve the past. It was all good, but... Come on. Come on. And we want to memorialize the past. Let's keep and glorify this. But God is not a God of monuments. God may be the God in the Old Testament, but He is done with the Old Covenant. In fact, let me tell you this. The New Covenant is not actually new because it was the original one. It was the original. The new covenant, God knew that already from the time that Adam and Eve sinned. That's why he killed an animal, made sheepskin out of it, and put it around Adam and Eve. Christ's sacrifice was planned from the foundation of the world, even before the creation. It's the original covenant. So what are we going to do? Past glories are good, but they're not as good as the glory of Jesus. You got to leave the past behind. I mean, I don't mean that we forget the past. But we need to leave the past glories behind. So this is something that we need to do. We need to leave the past glories behind. I'm not saying those glories are 100% bad. All I'm saying is we cannot rest on our laurels. It's, it's done. It's, it's over. God is doing a new thing. God is pouring out new wine. Jesus Christ is the new wine. Secondly, listen to and follow Jesus. And I would add, only. Listen to and follow Jesus only. That's why he was the only one left on that mountain. Moses and Elijah both disappeared. Because it's over. There's a new covenant in place. You don't want to go back to your old marriage, do you? If you have a new marriage. Who wants to go back to the old marriage? <laughs> so, you understand what I mean, right? If you're in a new covenant, don't go back to the old covenant. 
I mean, it's good for us to understand what happened to them. Those are lessons in the past, but that is not like your new marriage covenant. Yes. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 14. And I'll just breeze right through this because all I'm trying to get out of this is that what Peter says about pursuing Jesus Christ. Verse 7, chapter 3, <clears throat> Philippians. But whatever were gains to me, what were those gains? Those were his credentials. Being a rabbi, being a, a Benjamite, being a Hebrew of Hebrews, being a Pharisee. It says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, verse 8, I consider everything, not just some things, everything, a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith, emphasis on faith, in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. See, your righteousness does not come from keeping the law. Your righteousness comes from having faith in Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. Verse 11, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this, no, I haven't, I haven't arrived, but, or have already arrived, he actually says that, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But I'm, I'm not to the spirit of me. I'm not resurrected. I have a spirit, and I have the spirit of God. But one thing I do, forgetting the past, what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Where is Jesus now? Behind me, in me, everywhere he is. But what is Jesus saying? Father said, listen to him. What is Jesus saying to the church, to the body of Christ? Follow me. What is Jesus saying to GCLB? And what is Jesus doing right now? Mm -hmm. Sometimes what we do is we want to maintain and keep, you know, we're always on maintenance mode. Jesus is not on maintenance mode. But what is Jesus doing right now? We need to find out. What is God telling us? So we can go join Jesus Christ in doing what He's doing right now. And He's not just here in our meetings. That's only one and a half hours a week. He's not here 24 hours, seven days a week. What's He doing the rest of the time? You know, we need to ask those questions. Keep on asking those questions. You'll be surprised what He wants you to do with him because he's not going to tell you go do this and he's not with you he's going to tell you come follow me come follow me i'm going this way